This is AutoLine Daily, the show dedicated to enthusiasts of the global automotive industry. It's day 34 of the UAW strike, and we're starting to see more damage to the auto industry. The Anderson Economic Group estimates that the cost of the strike to the U.S. economy is at $7.7 billion. But it's actually higher than that because Anderson says its calculation included info up until October 12th, which was six days ago. The total losses include OEM wages, lost production, supplier wages and earnings, as well as losses at dealerships and with their customers. And another casualty is that Stellantis canceled its plans to go to CES in January. Stellantis blames the UAW strike and says it has to cut costs anywhere it can. The company has used CES for major concept unveils, including the Fiat 500 Cento Venti, the Chrysler Airflow, the Chrysler Synthesis, the Chrysler Portal, the Peugeot Inception, and the Ram EV pickup. If it had any concepts to unveil at CES this coming January, we'll probably see Stellantis do some sort of online reveal instead. Meanwhile, the Canadian Union Unifor told Stellantis it has until October 29th to sign a new labor contract or face a strike. Unifor has already signed contracts with Ford and GM. Stellantis has more manufacturing facilities and employs more Unifor workers in Canada than any other automaker, so it has the most to lose. Ford announced some organizational changes this morning. It says these represent the last cornerstones in its Ford Plus growth plan. Kumar Gaholtra, who was running Ford Blue, the ICE side of the company, will now be the chief operating officer of Ford, overseeing all industrial operations, including all ICE and hybrid engineering, purchasing and manufacturing. Andrew Frick, who has a sales and marketing background, will now take over Ford Blue. Doug Field, who is in charge of developing EVs and software platforms, will continue to do that. And the same goes for Ted Canis, who runs Ford Pro, the commercial side of the company. No change there either. It's clear that the traditional dealership sales model has to evolve, but direct-to-consumer sales are not for everyone either, which is why we think we're seeing companies that only use dealers start to also offer direct sales, and companies that only offer direct sales start to open dealerships as well. In August, Stellantis announced that Citroën would be its first brand to offer direct sales and fixed pricing in Europe. Then last month, Xpeng, said it would start phasing out direct sales in favor of dealerships in China. And now we're seeing even more. BMW will adopt direct sales and fixed pricing in Europe in addition to its traditional dealerships. First will be the mini brand at the beginning of 2024, and then BMW will follow in 2026. Somewhat interestingly, BMW will sell both new and used cars this way. Moving in the opposite direction is Chinese automaker NIO. Reuters reports it's thinking about building a dealer network in Europe instead of just offering direct sales and operating a couple of stores as a way to speed up its sales, which have been lower than expected in Europe. With so many companies going the other way from what they had been doing, we think it's inevitable that a hybrid sales model will be adopted in most of the world. In other BMW news, the group announced that it will integrate Tesla's NAX connector into its EVs starting in 2025 and will also gain access to its supercharger network in North America at the same time. The new 5 Series, including the all-electric i5, which will launch in most markets before the end of November, will obviously miss out on this benefit for a little bit, but no doubt it will be added to the list of approved vehicles. BMW also teased the new wagon version, the 5 Series Touring that will come out in the spring of next year, and says it will have all the same powertrains as the sedan. There's a big political divide in the U.S. over EVs. 
Democrats are pushing to get more on the road, while Republicans claim that nobody wants them. And now, mostly Republican-controlled states are charging big fees to EV owners. At least eight states are charging $200 or more for annual registration fees, and all but one, Pennsylvania, is controlled by Republicans. The GOP claims it's an effort to make up for lost gas tax revenue, since EV owners don't have to pay taxes on gas. But critics say it's an effort to discourage EV purchases. While gas tax revenues have fallen over the last several years, that has more to do with gas-powered vehicles being more fuel efficient. And according to state transportation officials, the extra EV fees won't do much to help fill the funding gap and they'll only boost budgets by 0.1 to 3%. BYD says its Q3 profits soared. The Chinese EV maker is forecasting that its Q3 net profit will range from $1.3 to $1.6 billion, an increase of 67 to 102% compared to a year ago. It's incredible just how fast BYD is growing and it shows that it has no problem making money on the vehicles that it sells. We learned at the SAE Propulsion Conference that as many as 57% of the vehicles in the world could still have some sort of IC engine by 2050. So one of the big questions will be, how do you make them cleaner? The answer might still be ICE, but ICE that runs on hydrogen fuel. Honda, Toyota, Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamaha are all collaborating on a hydrogen-powered ICE vehicle that will compete in the off-road to car rally. The engine is a supercharged dual overhead cam four cylinder with four valves per cylinder. And this is just one test that they hope leads to the development of a hydrogen-powered ICE for small mobility applications. And there's a number of benefits, including no worries about when, where, or how long to charge. You get the same payload and range, and there's vastly reduced emissions. However, the best applications seem to be for big buses, trucks, and ships, generators, and construction equipment. A diesel bus costs about $170,000. A hydrogen-powered ICE bus is about $180,000. But a BEV bus is roughly 500 grand, and a fuel cell powered bus would cost about $700,000. Hydrogen fuel is capable of powering all the ICE vehicles in the world with not a ton of modification. But the biggest drawback is it takes a lot of water to make hydrogen fuel. And before we go, we wanna recognize a historical milestone in the use of new materials in the auto industry. The Society of Plastic Engineers, or SPE, is honoring the 1948 Cadillac Series 60, 61, and 62 for being the first to use acrylic taillight lenses. It was made possible by the invention of a new polymer discovered by Dr. Otto Rahm in 1932 called polymethyl metacrylate. The SPE says it was a game changer in automotive design. Quote, replacing ground glass and enabling a renaissance of new lighting designs for all OEMs. You know, plastic light covers are something that we take for granted today, but back then, it was quite a breakthrough. And that little history lesson brings us to the end of today's show. Thanks for tuning in. Auto Line Daily is brought to you by Bridgestone, solutions for your journey. Intrepid Control Systems, over-the-air engineering, boost your game. And by Scheffler, we pioneer motion. We want to know what drives your testing. OTA, connected car, diagnostics, remote testing. Intrepid Control Systems is here to help you work from anywhere. Intrepid Control Systems, driven by your data. At Schaeffler, we pioneer motion. Electrifying mobility. Manufacturing smarter. Reducing CO2 emissions. Making energy production clean. 
Scheffler pioneers motion to advance how the world moves.